Thank you for the Rodney and good morning my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, our dear young people and friends. I need to do some tidying up from last night. I was clock watching. I didn't want to go over time and so I actually left a few things undone. It wasn't so much in what I said that was lacking but in what I didn't say. And so some of you found it difficult to join the dots when we were talking about the red garment in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 21. So I think it's probably uh, worthwhile just adding those couple of things that were essential to join the dots. You know, the, the Latin Vulgate translation actually translates that phrase, which is in the AV as Babylonish garment, which are the two words, um, shina adoret, it translates them a red garment or a scarlet robe. So there's no question that it was, in fact, a red robe. You know why? We pointed out last night, brethren, sisters and young people, that Shinar is the Hebrew form of the original name of Semiramis, Sumeramat. Right? So when you bring Sumar into the Hebrew, it becomes Shinar. And of course, Semiramis plays a very important part in this story. She was the wife of Nimrod, a very dominant woman. She, I believe, is the, the, the symbology that's picked up in Revelation chapter 17. She's the one that the scripture goes back to. She's the beginning of it all. She had two orders of priests. She had an inner circle of priests who controlled access to her. They controlled the door. You couldn't get to see Semiramis unless you went through one of these priests. They happened to wear scarlet robes. And because they controlled the door, of course, they were very, very powerful. The Roman Catholic Church has modelled itself on that system. Because you see, the cardinals will go inside a room and lock the rest of the world out. You can't get in there. They control the door and they appoint from amongst themselves the next god of the earth. As Revelation chapter 11 describes, the papacy, the god of the earth. So what kind of garments do cardinals wear? Well, red. Where does the word cardinal come from, do you know? It's the Latin cardo, which happens to mean the hinge. The hinge of the door. The controller of the door. That's why cardinals are named cardinals. All right, so you can begin to see the connection here with the goodly Babylonish gun, the red robe that Achan stole uh, from Jericho. Now, of course, Simeramus had a lower order of priests too. They wore black because, like many in this camp, they had to tend the fires, the sacrificial fires. And you do tend to get a bit of charcoal on you uh, when you're tending fires, but it doesn't show up on black, does it? It shows up on red, but not on black. And so that's the reason why we can be pretty sure that what Achan stole from Jericho was, in fact, a Babylonish priestly gun. Does that join the dots for you? I hope so. Well, you know, the very next verse that we would have read if we kept on reading into Genesis 45 says this, brothers and sisters, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before the event. I don't know about you, but even when I do this as a daily reading every year, I find it hard. I find it very hard to refrain myself from tears. You like that? When you read this story, it digs into you. And you can see, you can see in this, the hand of God at work in the, in the lives of the brethren of Joseph. And using Joseph, of course, who we hear as a type of Christ, as the Redeemer, using Joseph as the vehicle to achieve that. Now I said to you last night that we'd have a look initially in this study today at the parables of the lost. So I'd like you to come with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 15. Because I think, unquestionably, the story that we are considering, uh, considering here in our studies this weekend was in the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ when he spoke the parables of the lost. Here he was, fulfilling the types of the Old Testament. Here's the, here's the increaser, Joseph, the one who's come to redeem Israel. Where is he? Well, he's here in Judea. Well, it's known as the land of Judah. 
Alright? He's here to deal with the last days of Judah's commonwealth. And what's the character of the nation that he finds? Well, exactly like Judah in Genesis chapter 38, isn't it? Exactly like Judah. All of those characteristics that we saw yesterday are revealed in the nation before him. So he, he chooses, very selectively chooses, the two classes of people that are before him. So Luke chapter 15 and in verse 1 tells us who those classes were. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. So here we have the lost class. But then we read in verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. So here's our second class. And the parables, of course, flow on from that. You have the parable of lost sheep. Well, where, where is the sheep lost? Well, outside the house. Wandering aimlessly outside the house. But then we have the parable of the coin. Well, where's the coin lost? Well, it's lost inside the house, isn't it? So you've got these two phases of Judah's life. Initially he was lost inside the house, then he was lost outside the house. Now what follows, of course, is an expansion upon those two parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin. Why coin, do you think? Well, what was the driving motivation of the, of the upper class in Judea at that time? The priests, you know, the owners of the biggest business in the world, the temple business. All right, what was their motivation? Obvious, isn't it? Money, coins. So the Lord Jesus Christ chooses the coin for that reason. And he came to save them equally as, as those that were sheep lost. He wanted to save them both. But of course he found it very difficult to save the elder son. As the next parable goes on, you have the parable probably wrongly titled the parable of the, the prodigal son. It's more it's, it's, it's a parable that's got more in it than just a lost son. It's, there's two sons lost in that parable. And of course there's a loving father who seeks to redeem both of them. And that's what Yahweh did for Judah. When he was lost inside the house, God was at work, he didn't recognise it. When he's lost outside the house, God was at work. And it took him a long time to recognise it. 22 years, in fact. But God got him in the end. All right? He wanted to redeem Judah, even though he was outside the house. So, we have these wonderful parables before us. <coughs> now, just a couple of passages out of these parables. You know how they flow on. There's five parables here. All of them interrelated. So you have the lost sheep, the lost coin, you have the lost sons, and the loving Father who seeks to redeem both. And then you have, in chapter 16 of Luke, you have the parable of the unjust steward. Now it's important to notice, because this is an expansion, this parable is an expansion of the problem of the elder son who was lost inside the house. And it opens with these words in Luke 16, verse 1, and he said unto his disciples, there was a certain, and look at it, there was a certain rich man, what do you think about when you've got rich men, you know? You know the pile of coins of the, uh, of the cartoons. Yeah, all right. Scrooge McDuck, you know, you think of pile of coins, the rich man. This rich man here is actually to represent the high priest of Israel. And he occurs again in the next parable, the fifth parable, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in verse 19. And there was a certain rich man yeah, it's the high priest. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know it because <coughs> over in Luke 16 and at verse 27, we read this. Now, I'm not going to go through the fabric of the parable. You know it as well as I do. You've got this rich man who finds himself in a very real predicament. He's looking for a way out. doesn't seem to be a way out. So he makes a request in the fabric of the parable. Verse 27. And he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, it's a fact of history that at the time that this was spoken, Caiaphas was the high priest. But effectively he wasn't the high priest because the real kingmaker was Annas. 
Now Annas was high priest from 6 AD to 15 AD and he was deposed by the Romans because he was too powerful. And you remember that he retained that power because they brought the Lord Jesus Christ to him first, not to Caiaphas. He was the kingmaker. He was the big man. He was the controller of the business. He was the rich man. And you see, at the time, Caiaphas was doing his job. Now it just so happens that Annas had five sons, all of whom became high priests between now, Luke 16, and AD 70. He had five sons. So he had a son-in-law, Caiaphas, who was actually high priest, and another five sons who would become high priest in their time. And so here you've got, as it were, Caiaphas saying these words in the parable. I've got five brethren, the sons of Annas, all of whom are going to become high priests. Sin. Sin Lazarus. Now why Lazarus do you think? Well, Lazarus is a man who was resurrected from the dead. And a few weeks later, Christ was going to raise Lazarus. Read on in the parable. Verse 29. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, my father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And one did go unto them from the dead, called Lazarus. And they pursued him on the orders of the high priest to put him to death. It shows how far they were gone. They were truly lost inside the house. But you see, there was another one that was dead in this series of parables, wasn't there? Another one who was dead. And we read at the end of chapter 15, the words of the Father. Now I know that some of you will want me to go and explain why, or, you know, the parable of the unjust steward. You can do that later on. Can't do it now. All right? But I'm doing this for a reason. The last verse of chapter 15 will tell you the reason. Now, let me just step back one or two verses. Verse 31. The father addresses the very upset elder son. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this, thy brother, was dead and is alive again and was lost and it's found. Yeah, here's a Lazarus class, isn't it? He's dead. And is alive again. And spiritually, brothers and sisters and young people, that's exactly where Judah was. He was dead. Lost inside the house, and then lost outside the house. But the time has come for redemption. And that's the story before us this morning. As we come back now to Genesis chapter 43 and 44. What a massive reformation this is. I don't need to recount to you what we spoke about yesterday and the list, the litany of problems that Judah had Genesis 38, 37 and 38. So what could change Judah? Worldly. Covenant breaker. And fornicator. Into the leader and reformer of his family. What was going to do that? Well we saw the hand of God at work in his life. <coughs> but let's just recount those disasters that occurred in Judah's life. We saw the unusual divine intervention in the death of Ur and Onan. God clearly at work. We saw the death of his Canaanitish wife and the grief that came to him. There were bitter memories in Judah's mind that he could not erase. They were etched in his memory. You couldn't forget the look on Jacob's face when they told him the news about Joseph. And they couldn't forget the grief that Jacob experienced for the next 20 odd years. The bitter memories of Jacob's grief were working away in his mind in the wake of his own losses. 
When he, when he felt his own grief, he understood the grief of his father. His conscience was afflicted by a broken promise made to Tamar. There was the exposure and the humiliation as a one-off fornicator and hypocrite. And then famine destroyed his life's assets and his worldly prospects. God was indeed at work to produce a desired end. The recovery of this man who was dead, who was lost, who was about to be found. He's the model of the nation that our Lord Jesus Christ had to deal with when he came. And we're going to see even more of that as we proceed, God willing. So then, we're going to have a brief look at Genesis 43, verses 1 to 14. And what we're going to see in that section is a completely changed Judah. We're going to see calmness, firmness, resolution, and altruism. Now, let me explain what altruism means. Altruism is actually the spirit of one who cares nothing for himself, but does everything for others. The greatest model, the example of altruism in history, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ. He did not come to serve himself, came to serve others. And everything he did had a focus on the well-being of others, not of himself. Now let me ask you, how does your nature work? Naturally. Well, I know how mine works, naturally. It's usually I'm number one. Okay? Occasionally my wife might get number one, but it's usually me. Alright? That's how it is. That's human nature. That's the way we are. And so altruism is the absolute antithesis of the way that man normally operates. And we see that here in Judah. He reveals a complete change of attitude towards God, and that's especially important, isn't it? And towards his father. Now let's have a look at what happens here. The events of Genesis 43, 1-14 are preceded by the stupidity of Reuben. So step back to chapter 42, and verse, we won't read it all, maybe just for verse 35. It came to pass... As they emptied their sacks, the bottle, this is when they got back to Jacob in the land. Every man's bundle of money was in his sack, and they saw the bundles of money. Jacob their father said in verse 36, Me ye have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and you didn't bring Simeon back with you. Simeon's locked away in prison. Now, of course, Joseph had chosen Simeon for an obvious reason. Simeon was the, the cruel one amongst his brothers. You know, he was the one that wanted to... When, when they were throwing Joseph in the pit, he was the one that had that angry look on his face that he would kill him. So when the chance came, Joseph takes Simeon and locks him away to cool his heels for 12 months. Yeah, and that's going to have an effect on him too. So he says, I've lost Joseph, now I've lost Simeon, and you want to take Benjamin? Come on, give me a break. Jacob is very, very distressed. All these things are against me, he says. And so Reuben, under the impact of his father's obvious turmoil, makes a, a stupid, ridiculous statement. Look at verse 37. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Hang on, how's that going to solve the problem? He's lost Joseph. He hasn't got Simeon. And Reuben, you're saying that if we don't bring Benjamin back, you're going to slay two more of my grandchildren. Come on! How stupid is that? But it shows you what we'll see a little later on in our study this morning, God willing, about the instability of Reuben. But even he changed, you know. And we're going to see that right at the end. And the, what's happening to Judah is just the beginning of a long process that happens to all the brothers. This is about the redemption of them all. And Reuben is going to go through that same process. And so verse 38, he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. 
If mischief befall him by the way in which ye go, then shall he bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. So what would you do, brothers and sisters, if you are one of these sons standing before your father? Now what I want you to do, when we come to these two sections in chapter 43 and 44, that we're going to have a brief look at, what I want you to do is what I try and do when I come to, to study these sections of Scripture. I try and go back and put myself there. I try and recreate the scene in my mind to, to try and get a feel for the emotions that are flowing here, for the looks on people's faces, for the human reactions that occur, to try and relive it. If you can do that, you'll get hold of it, and it will get hold of you. So let's have a look at it with that in mind. Create the pictures in your mind. How would you have responded to what Jacob said? What would you have done? Well, we know what happened. Because <coughs> the record of chapter 43 says this. The famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them in desperation, <coughs> Go again, buy us a little food. So sometime down the track, when all the food that they brought out of Egypt is now gone, and they're up against a brick wall, the issue comes up again. So who, who is going to be to the fore here? Well, verse... Three tells us. And Judah spake unto him, saying. Now does Judah come out and say, Slay my two sons like Reuben did? No. A lot more sense in what he says. And he recounts what happened in Egypt. The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. Thou wilt send our brother with us. We will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. So how does Jacob react? He's called Israel here, by the way. And Israel said, Well, why did you tell him? Why did you tell the man that you had brethren and put me in this predicament? <coughs> Look what they say. Verse 7. And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the word, to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? In other words, what they were saying is, Dad, you taught us to be honest. <coughs> Christadelphians don't tell lies. Christadelphians tell the truth. You taught us to tell the truth, Dad. And when he asked us the question, have you got a father and brothers, we told him the truth. What did you want us to tell him? And Judah, verse 8, said unto Israel his father, send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die. Both we and thou and also our little ones. They were desperate. I will be a surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned this second time. And their father said, All right, we've got no option. Must be so. Away you go. Feel attention in that room? Who is it? Who is it that Jacob now looks to and trusts? Trusts the life of Benjamin, and indeed his own life, into the hands of it's Judah. Now what a change. Would you have believed Judah in the middle of Genesis 38 if he'd made that assurance? Would you have had confidence that you could rely upon him? No, he couldn't even keep a promise of Tamar. But now Jacob has seen a change in this man. And that change is going to be revealed beautifully in chapter 44. So let's come to chapter 44. We're going to pick it up at verse 14. Now you know the story, we just read the story about the opening of the sacks, the finding of, the, of Joseph's cup, his silver cup in the mouth of Benjamin's sack. All of course designed by Joseph to bring about the, the, the required end. 
He's working to redeem his brethren. So verse 14, they come back. Can you imagine how sheepish they were and how, how downcast they were? Because the prospect was that they would spend the rest of their lives either as prisoners or as slaves in Egypt. That was the prospect before them. So verse 14 we read, And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground, thus of course fulfilling in part the dreams of Genesis 37. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Watch ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine. Now we read that back, if you have a look back in verse 5 of Genesis 44, <coughs> Joseph's servant said to the brethren, Is not this in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Well, you notice the margin says, maketh trolls. This is not voodooish. This is not voodoo here that, that's being referred to. In actual fact, the translation that is given of verse 15 in Young's literal goes this way. Have ye not known that a man like me doth diligently observe? So it's around, about making trolls. So the margin is not too bad. It's about making trolls. In other words, what the servant said about this carp and what Joseph says about it is that Joseph was able to observe and make trial soundly make judgments alright I'm not talking about the cup having any particular significance well of course Joseph knew what his brethren didn't know of course he was observing them in a way that they didn't understand just as God had been. And he was working to redeem them. But I want you to notice, brothers and sisters and young people, that Joseph's words in verse 15 actually frame Judah's response. What now comes from Judah arises from what Joseph says in verse 15. <coughs> Have ye not known that a man like me doth diligently observe? Because God had also observed them and that's what Judah now acknowledges. You have a look with me at verse 16. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Now, you can see, you can see that what Judah says is actually framed, it comes from what Joseph has said. Now, let me ask you a question, brothers and sisters and young people. Anybody here wants to volunteer to come up to the platform now and confess their failings before, you know, before uh, God? Anyone? Well, you know, if this was a Pentecostal-type meeting, it might be a flood. But no one's going to do that, are they? When was the last time you heard someone get up in front of a, of a crowd of people, especially a ruler, you, you know, and they thought it was a Gentile ruler, they thought Joseph was a, you know, a Gentile. When was the last time that Christadelphians did that? Tell me. Doesn't happen. Does it? But it happens here. You have a Christadelphian who thinks he's in front of a Gentile ruler, who he believes can take his life in a moment like that, and he gets up and says publicly, before them all, all the Egyptians there with Joseph, all right? We don't know how many that were there, but there would have been Egyptians there. Publicly says, God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. Now that, that is testimony to the conversion of Judah. You would not do that unless you were profoundly converted public expression of guilt that they were suffering because of what they'd done not just to Joseph but to their father and that comes out in what follows as well because there's something very fascinating about the way Joseph does this because he's actually testing that conversion you know that? because he actually offers an amnesty he offers them this amnesty. Verse 17. 
of Genesis 44. And he said, let it not be that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he should be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. So he's saying, look, I don't want to retain Benjamin. I'll keep Benjamin, and you can all go back to your father. Now, if this had been 22 or 25 years before, guess what the brothers would have said? Thank you very much. Yeah, goodbye. Uh, Ta-da, Benjamin. Might see you later. Bye-bye. No. It's different now, isn't it? This is not about profit anymore. This is not about personal gain. We read in verse 18. Now, this is... This is a very touching little incident. Get this picture in your mind. Recreate this picture of these brethren. They're bowed down, heads bowed before Joseph. Judah's their spokesman. And now he does something quite dramatic. Verse 18. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears and let not thine anger burn against thy servant for thou art even as Pharaoh I know that you could just flick your fingers and one of your servants come out and cut my head off I know that <coughs> what an acknowledgement what a fulfilment of the dreams in a way eh? but what an attitude brothers and sisters he came near unto him. Can you see Judah tentatively moving up, sidling up towards Joseph to speak in his ear quietly? The intense look on his face. Can you see that? This is a truly converted man. And of course we don't need to read the rest of the story because what he does is he recounts the history, doesn't he? Of their trips backwards and forwards of the reaction to their father, of the grief that had overtaken Jacob. All of that comes out in that story. But we come down to verse 30. Genesis 44, verse 30. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad, Benjamin, be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us that he will die and thy servant shall bring down the grey hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave for thy servant became surety for the lad it's a word that means a guarantor I became a guarantor for the lad unto my father saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord. And let the lad go up with his brethren. Now look at this. We talked about altruism. Altruism is where you have absolutely no concern for yourself or for your own things. Now think about what Judah's offering here, brothers and sisters. He's offering to stay in the place of Benjamin in Egypt as a slave, as a bondman, which means he's going to be absent from his family. We don't know if he's remarried. He may have a wife at home. He's got children all right, at home. He's not going to go back to them, ever. All right? This is what he's offering. Away from his family, away from his children, never to see him again. And he's prepared to make that sacrifice. That's altruism. Not thinking about self at all. Now why would he do that? Why would he make this sacrifice? Because he can't forget the grief on his father's face. And he could not possibly do any more to his father because he knows it will kill him. In fact, when the news arrived that Joseph was still alive, Jacob almost died. Have a look at chapter 45 and verse 26. Verse 
Genesis 45 and 26 says, maybe verse 25, they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted for he believed them not. Look up the Hebrew. His heart stopped. He almost died of a heart attack with the surprise of the news. So if he, he almost died from hearing the good news that Joseph was still alive. What would have happened to him if the news had been, well, Benjamin's not coming home. I'm sorry. Benjamin's not coming home. You can just imagine what would have happened to Jacob. And so could Judah. And it was that, brothers and sisters, it was that that made him offer himself in place of Benjamin. You know, if you want to console those who have suffered massive grief and like Jacob are virtually inconsolable, who do you send? Well, you send someone who knows a bit about it. Someone who's experienced a little bit of grief like that. Who can be absolutely sensitive to the feelings of the victim of the grief. Yeah, that's who you send. You don't send someone who hasn't had any experience, do you? They might be very sympathetic. What you need is someone who's empathetic. They're empathetic because of experience. And that's what happens here. Judah has become very empathetic. He cannot do this to his father. That's what he says here at the end of Genesis 44. Verse 33. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad upon to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. I watched it for 22 years. I can't do this to them. I simply can't do it to him anymore. That's what the parables of the lost are about. How much grief have we given our father? And I mean our natural father. How much grief have we given our Father? We're emotional beings, brothers and sisters and young people, because we like our God. We were made like Him. He's an emotional being. How much grief do we give Him? The one thing that I've learned in a life of ups and downs, and most of us go through a life of ups and downs, But if you want to avoid going back to the old sins, just think for a while about the look on your father's face. When you cause him grief, that helps me. How do you feel when your children go astray? Happy? Or grief speaking? That's the lesson, isn't it? You want to be converted? That's helpful. So have a marvellous and dramatic scene. But it ends wonderfully. So where does this complete conversion lead to, brothers and sisters? Where does it lead to? I want you to come to Genesis chapter 46. Pick it up from verse 27 where we read. And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. Oh, oh, I should have read verse 27. Which reads, The sons of Joseph which were born him in Egypt were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob which came into Egypt were three score and ten. Now I was going to make a brief comment about the three score and ten and 
and Stephen's comment in Acts 7.14 where he mentioned 75, but those of you who want to follow that through, I'm, I'm watching the time, I know what the time is. Uh, those of you who want to follow that through can get the notes and do that for yourself. Too technical and too long for this uh, period of the talk. So the important thing about the 70 that's mentioned here though is that Jacob's family is the microcosm of the 70 nations of Genesis chapter 10. And those of you who have followed that theme through the scripture will know just how important that is. For example, Deuteronomy 32 verse 8 says that when God divided the nations, their inheritance, he divided them according to the number of the children of Israel. Well, Jacob had 12 sons. So it's not referring primarily to the 12. It's referring to the 70 here. Because 12 is the number of Israel and 70 is the number of the nations. And that plays a massive role in the following scriptures, right through to the end of our scriptures, the Revelation. I won't go to that now. What we wanted was the fact that in verse 28, when Jacob looks to someone to organise what really is an incredible mission of shifting his family, a very large family, we don't know the exact number of it. We know that Abraham had an encampment of probably around a thousand people at Hebron. We don't know the exact size of Jacob's encampment. But we know he had 70 sons, or grands, you know, sons and grandsons, and they have obviously wives, etc., and there are children, and there are servants, so who knows? It could have been anything up to a thousand. We don't know. But what we do know is that it was a massive task. If I was to ask someone here to organise the shifting of 1,000 Christabelphians from Adelaide to Brisbane, and that would be a good thing, you'd help us out, Anybody put their hand up for that task? Anyone? Of course not. You wouldn't want to take on that for anything, would you? So when you're looking for someone to organise something of that magnitude, you've got to have confidence in them. Absolute confidence in them. So when Jacob looks around, who does he look to? No question. Not one question in his mind. Who can cope? with this task to shift him and all his family into Egypt Judah he becomes the leader of the family that's why that verse is important verse 28 of Genesis 46 it tells us of the confidence that Jacob has in Judah to lead them into the land of Goshen it says in that verse and Goshen means drawing near yeah they were going to draw near they were going to draw near to Joseph. And that's all that Jacob wanted. All he wanted was to see his son Joseph again. He could hardly believe that he was alive. What a difference, brothers and sisters, on the face of Jacob now. No longer the etching of grief, but now the prospect of seeing not only Joseph, but his sons, of whom we will speak this evening, God willing. That's the wonderful prospect before Jacob. And it all ends, of course, very happily for some. I want you to come with me now to Genesis 49. Now you're all aware that the early part of Genesis 49 is the prophecies of Jacob. Jacob blesses his son concerning the, the last days. It is in many respects, an inscrutable prophecy. We'll have a look at just one part of it this evening, God willing. We have a look at the prophecy concerning Judah. See where his conversion led him. But I want to focus now on where Judah's conversion led his brothers. And you see, that's one of the great things, isn't it? Is that if you get your act together, and this is especially important to our young people, because, you know, when you're young, I know what it's like to be young. A while ago, but I can I know what it's like to be young. You'd be sort of hither and thither. Yeah. And a bit unstable. Yeah. Well, Reuben was unstable. But Reuben was changed. The effect of one, just one young person, whether they be male or female, who gets their act together, if I can use that phrase, and makes the truth work in their life, 
the effect of that upon others around them is enormous. What they call peer pressure. Now normally peer pressure goes the other way, doesn't it? Normally misbehaviour produces more misbehaviour. Yeah, because of peer pressure. Oh, I can't let him or her get out in front of me. I've got to be the same. But it works the other way as well. If you get your act together, you can have a wonderful effect upon those around you. And that's what happens here. Judah is not just now the reformed. He becomes a reformer like Joseph. I'm going to see that and we have a look at Genesis 49. Now, first of all, I want you to have a look with me at verse 28. Verse 28 of Genesis 49 tells us this. He's just finished the blessing and concludes with Benjamin. He says this. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. Now I'm going to just quickly go through the first few verses of Genesis 49. And I want you to ask yourself whether you would regard it as a blessing. The things that are said about Reuben, the things that are said about Simeon and Levi, would you regard it as a blessing? Blessings? Really? No. That's not the way human beings will look at it. Because Reuben's exposed. A Simeon and Levi are exposed before their brothers. Here's a family gathering. Here's the father saying his last words to the family. And he's going to expose the three older boys for what they really are. In front of their brothers. Dad, what are you doing? I'm actually giving you a blessing. You know what, brothers and sisters? We've had some spectacular failures in our community we don't want to mention any more about it than that because I, I know that most of you are fully aware of it, all too aware of it spectacular failures which some of them at least have been exposed to the brotherhood with unbelievable consequences that was actually a blessing What if it had not been exposed? Hmm? Well, we, at least one outcome would be that the individual themselves won't be in the kingdom. Now, it may be terribly embarrassing. It may be very hurtful. It may have wide ramifications for the brotherhood. But it's actually the very best thing that God can do for you. <coughs> to expose you for what you really are so you can get your act together like Judah did. All right? And that's what happens to Reuben, Simeon and Levi. What they got is described as a blessing but they wouldn't have seen it that way at the time. <coughs> but they'll see it at the resurrection, that it was a blessing. So let's have a look at the early verses of Genesis 49. Now there were three aspects to the rites of the firstborn. There was the priesthood, right? The firstborn was the priest of the family. And that priesthood, of course, as we know, in the family of Jacob, had passed to Joseph. Reuben, who had been the firstborn, had the garment, as it were, stripped from him, given to Joseph. The second right of the firstborn was the authority of the family, the leadership of the family. Now, Reuben proved, of course, unworthy of that role. To whom was that given? Well, in the blessings of Jacob, it's given to Judah. And the third aspect of the right of the firstborn was the inheritance the double portion. To whom was that given? Well, to Joseph. 
So he has two tribes in Israel, doesn't he? Ephraim and Manasseh. And you'll notice the order in which I stated them because Ephraim was not the oldest. We'll come to that, God willing, this evening. So then, the right of the firstborn was great. And, there, and that, that process is unwound here in the early verses of Genesis 49. Verse 1 says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. I'll make a comment about the use of these two names, Jacob and Israel, later on this evening. Verse 3. Now, again, I ask you to paint the picture in your mind. Put yourself there. You've got an old man who's sitting on, a, on, on his bed, or you know, he's, he certainly looks old. He's about to die. He's probably got a day or two to live. All right? Very, very you know, tentative situation. He's this old man, and he calls his sons. He has got complete control of his brain, and so has God. And what comes out of the mouth of Jacob is actually in this inspired prophecy. Wonderful things to come. And if you're Reuben, you've got the line-up of brethren, as we pointed out, he doesn't bless them in the same order as their birth. But the line-up of brethren, he calls Reuben to step forward. You know, so in your mind, imagine you're Reuben. Step forward. It starts very well. Have a look at it. Verse 3. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. And Reuben's thinking, oh, this is pretty good. Now, in those statements are the three elements of the right of the firstborn. It says there, the beginning of my strength. It's a reference to the double portion aspect. The, the firstborn was to make sure that the family remained strong. He's given a double portion for that purpose. Alright? Beginning of my strength. And he says, the excellency of dignity. That's the priesthood. The firstborn's the priest of the family. He's the, you know, he's the very uh, statement of dignity in the family. And then he says the excellency of power. That's the aspect of authority in the family. So there's your three aspects of the right of the firstborn. So Reuben's feeling pretty good about himself right now. Until the next verse. Because in verse 4 we read, Unstable as water. That word unstable in the Hebrew, pakaz, means to froth like boiling water. Hence, of course, it refers to unrestrained lust. Hence, it's taking us back to Genesis 35, verse 22, when he went in to Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Jacob's wife. Unrestrained lust. He's the firstborn. I happen to be the firstborn in my family. It's not uh, your own greatest position to be in sometimes because there's an expectation of the firstborn isn't there there's an expectation that the firstborn will lead the way for his siblings how many firstborns succeed in the bible not too many but thankfully there's one who did his name is Jesus Christ <coughs> All right, but the, the role of the firstborn can be heavy at times this man is not worthy of the role. He's unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then defilest thou it. Now you've got to read your Bible carefully. Have a look what it says here at the end of verse 4. This is Jacob's statement to his sons. They're all hearing these words, and he's, he's eyeing off Reuben. But it, it changes at the end of the verse. See what it says? He went up to my couch. And I can see Jacob turning to the other brethren, his other sons, and making that statement. Yeah! He's the one! He 
he went up to my couch. So how do you reckon Reuben feels now? Exposed. I mean, they all knew anyway, but now it's publicly exposed at the end of Jacob's life. Before all the ecclesia, they know what Jacob thinks about the character of Reuben. And Reuben is thinking, where do I go from here? I've been watching my brother Judah. He's changed. I really am unstable. I have done some idiotic things. I have brought disgrace to my father and to his ecclesia. And it's about time I got my act together. And when you come to chapter 50, it appears as though he did. Chapter 50 of Genesis. Verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. So they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall he say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto the evil. And now, look at these words. The words we've just read were Jacob's words. But the words we're now going to read are the brethren's words. I wonder who's the spokesman here. And now, we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? <coughs> and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. He wept, you know, brothers and sisters, for two reasons. He wept because he saw in them a genuine repentance. And when you see someone who's genuinely repentant, that's your response, isn't it? But he also wept because in the words that they spake, there was a, a misrepresentation of his character. I didn't understand. I mean, he'd given, he'd given his life, so to speak, to save his brethren. And they thought he would take vengeance once Jacob was gone. You misread me. I'm all about saving you. Not taking vengeance. So here we believe, I believe we have some evidence at least that Reuben and his other brothers did repent and did make the changes that will see them most likely in the kingdom of God. Well, I can't, uh, because of the time, I can't say too much about Simeon and Levi, but they too received what's called a blessing in verses 5 through 7 of Genesis 49. And of course, reference is made there to the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ at the end of verse 6. They slew a man, an ish, and in their self-will they digged down a wall. Or as it should be rendered, they felled a chief. It's a reference to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, who was it that put our Lord Jesus Christ to death? Well, it was the priests and those who were associated with the government of the day. Weren't they? Well, it just so happens that Simeon, which inherited in Judah, Simeon was replaced <coughs> in the land at the time of the captivity by the Edomites, who became known as Egyptians to separate their area in the south of Judah from the land of Edom, where their father Esau had set up his kingdom. The Egyptians. And of course it was from those residual Edomites that arose Herod the Great and his successors. So prophecy is there, isn't it? Prophecy about the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to come now to make comment about where Reuben ends up. 
Did you know that the word firstborn occurs 13 times in Jacob's life? And that 13 is the number in the scriptures for rebellion, unstable as water, Jacob could say of his eldest son, Thou shalt not excel. But because, because the same process happened to Reuben that happened to Judah, guess where Reuben, at least the tribe of Reuben, and presumably he'll be there amongst them, uh, as an immortal we believe, but with a great interest in his descendants, who will now be back in the land with their king and with their rulers, which will include you and me and Reuben, we hope, Guess where the tribe of Reuben ends up in the scheme of things. Now it would be lovely to have something on the wall, you know, a map of the land divided up amongst the 12 tribes to show you this picture. So I'm going to have to paint the picture with words. If you were designing the inheritance of the tribes of Israel, how would you design it? There are 13 divisions to the land in the future. In the middle is what's called the prince's portion, which includes the Holy Oblation. Okay? Now in the Holy Oblation you have three parts. You have the northern section, which is given as a place of residence for the immortal saints who will minister in that house, as well as elsewhere, but they'll live there when they're in the land to minister in the house. The next section, the middle section of the Holy Oblation is given to the tribe of Levi because they will be the mortal ministers in the house of God and also in the temple, uh, in the city Yahweh Shemar as we said yesterday. And then that's, that southern section, it's a smaller section, is the profane or common section where Yahweh Shemar is located. So that's the 13th portion you might say of the land. Let's say it's the first. So what would you do if you were designing the inheritance of, the <coughs> of, of, of Israel? What would you do? Would you have an orderly six tribes above and six tribes beneath the Holy Oblation? Well, I think I would. But it's not that way. Do you know how many tribes there are to the north of the Holy Oblation? Seven. Which means that there are five to the south. And you might say, well, so what? Why not have six and six? What's six the number of? Many. So why have seven and five? Well, seven Amongst other things, it's the number of the Spirit, it's the number that speaks of completeness, but it's also the covenant number, isn't it? The second time you read the word Bereth in the Old Testament, it's in Genesis chapter 9, it occurs only once before that in Genesis chapter 6. The second time you read that word in a context, it occurs in Genesis 9, seven times, and there are seven colours to the rainbow which also appears in Genesis chapter 9. When God came to make promises to Abraham, he made seven promises through Abraham's life. The first one has seven clauses, and the last one, the seventh, has got seven stamped all over it. Seven. It's primarily the number of the Abrahamic covenant. It's got a red cord around it. And then to the north. So guess who's the first tribe above the Holy Oblation? Judah. Guess who's next? Reuben. So why have you got five to the south? Well, you don't get into the covenant land of Abraham unless it's by divine grace. Five. So who's the tribe next to the Holy Oblation to the south? The son of the right hand. Benjamin. There's a wonderful order, isn't there? In the way God goes about things, brothers and sisters. 
And if we, if we can be fully reformed, like Judah, and like Reuben, and his brothers, we're going to be there to see it.